and welcome to the episode 12 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. The highlights of the day include last-minute headlining, new friends, a new script, and a mysterious event. But let's move with some order. Two performances for the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums, on the 12th of January 1962. The first one is a lunchtime concert at the Cavern Club in Liverpool, sharing the bill with a Mike Cotton Jasmine. Then, starting at 11.30 pm, the Beatles headline a show at the Tower Ballroom in Wallasey. Sam Leach, promoter and organizer of the event, had turned to the lads at the 11th hour, when the original headliners, screaming Lord Such, failed to show up. The venue, capable of holding up to 5,000 people, was built in 1900, and it was used as a place for live performances until 1969, when it was destroyed by fire. In 1963, the Beatles played the Invicta Ballroom in Chatham, Kent, the furthest south that the band had ever performed to date. The trip to Chatham was 170 miles, about 273 kilometers, and it was another sign that the lads were becoming more in demand outside Liverpool and the North. On the 12th of January 1964, the Beatles returned at the London Palladium for a new performance on the TV show Val Parnell's Sunday Night at the London Palladium. After their debut in the ATV show on the 13th of October 1963, the night in which Beatlemania was officially born, the band quadrupled their engagement fee, now clocking at a thousand pounds, about 20,400 pounds in 2020 money. The Fab Four had become a national institution. They spent the day at the theatre, partly rehearsing their bit and getting ready for the live broadcast, taking place between 8.25 and 9.25 pm at the top of the bill. The band took part to the show with a performance of I Want to Hold Your Hand, This Boy, All My Loving, Money That's What I Want, and Twist and Shout, as well as performing a comedy skit which show compare Bruce Forsyth. Other acts on the bill were singer Alma Cogan and comedian Dave Allen. It was the first time that the Beatles met Cogan. As you might recall, in the sixth episode of What A Fab Day, they had just missed her performance at the Talk of the Town in London, and so they were somewhat eager to meet her. Cogan invited them at her flat, shared with her mother and sister. The lads, now skilled in making a quick exit from venues, actually arrived when she was still busy in her dressing room at the Palladium. The 12th of January 1965 saw the Beatles busy in another two houses of the Another Beatles Christmas Show production, at the Amersmith Audion Cinema, London. On this date in 1966, John Lennon, Cynthia Lennon, Ringo Starr and Maureen Starkey flew together to Port of Spain, Trinidad, for a winter holiday in the sun. On the 12th of January 1967, in the morning, trumpeter David Mason received a call by George Martin, summoning him in Abbey Road for a 17th of January session. Mason was to supply Pico trumpet to Penny Lane. I guess he really made an impression on Paul McCartney during the previous evening's Brandenburg concerto performance on BBC Two. Later in the day, more classical instruments overdubbing for Penny Lane took place between 2.30 and 11 pm in Abbey Road's EMI Studios. Bert Kirtley and Duncan Campbell played trumpet, Dick Morgan and Mike Winfield played oboe and cor anglais, and Frank Clark played double bass. Two rough mono mixes were completed before the end of the session. The cor anglais parts were not used in the released mix of the song and can be heard on the Anthology 2 album. The double bass, instead, can be heard briefly on the line Bankers Sit Waiting for a Trim. Also on this date, Walter Shenson, producer of the films A Hard Day's Night and Help, 
contacted playwright John Orton on a matter concerning the Beatles. Shanson, advised by Brian Epstein, wanted Orton to rewrite the script in his possession and turn it into something more exciting for the next Beatles movie. Orton was known by the Beatles. Paul McCartney had invested a thousand pounds, about eighteen thousand two hundred seventy pounds in 2020 money, in one of his plays called Lute, and Brian Epstein had commented that he thought Orton was the perfect writer for a Beatles film. Orton took three days to read the existing script and think about it, meeting Shenson again on the 16th of January and McCartney and Epstein on the 24th of January. We will talk more about the script on this latter date. On the 12th of January 1968, George Harrison was at the EMI's facilities in Bombay, India, between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. local time. Having concluded the work on the Wonderworld soundtrack, George decided to use the local musicians he had employed for that project to record a number of traditional Hindu ragas, as they could be of use in a Beatles record further down the line. One of these would eventually become the Inner Light. The instrumental track was completed in five takes and later completed in London. Let's conclude this episode with a bit of a mystery. Beatlesbible.com talks about a 12th of January 1969 meeting of the four Beatles at Ringo Starr's house to sort out the differences between Harrison and the rest of the band. They don't cite their source. Lewison's The Complete Beatles Chronicle, very precise with these kind of details, doesn't list the meeting as happening, though. In fact, George is referred to being Liverpool, at his parents. Whatever the case, it is time to remind you to please check www.simonmas.com support to find ways to support What A Fab Day and allow me to continue working on it. On the website, you will also find a form to contact me with ideas if you want to help me improving. In the description, instead, you will find an Amazon affiliate link with all the books and material you might want to delve into the history of the Beatles by yourself. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.